Hello, everybody. My name is uh, Shana Smith. I'm a country manager for the Benelux uh, for BlaBlaCar since uh, two years now. So basically what I do on a daily basis is trying to get BlaBlaCar known all over uh, the Benelux. Thank you, Shana. Hello, my name is Els Ampe. Uh, I'm a member of the Brussels Parliament and also deputy mayor of the city of Brussels. Uh, my competence are mobility and public works. And since uh, 11 years, uh, I am in Brussels Parliament and I try uh, to uh, reduce the gap between science technology on one side and the political society and the society as a whole on the other side. Hi, my name is uh, Jan Lutke. I'm the country manager for Move It uh, in Germany. Um, take care of the German-speaking countries. And uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here. Uh, hi, I'm Alex from the Belgian Fiscal Authorities. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Philip Nautmans, uh, general manager from uh, Uber Belgium. So I heard the name Uber already in, uh, in the presentation before this as one of the questions. So I'm looking forward to many more questions from you. Hello everybody, I'm Roger Kestelot. I'm the CEO of a public transport uh, company in Flanders, uh, a very traditional company. Some years ago, we tried to reinvent ourselves now in the new world we're living in. So if you have never met a disruptive dinosaur, here's one. Um, there will also be some uh, polled questions to the audience as well later on um, in between uh, some of the questions to the panel members and please also submit your questions via WooClap as well, um, which we can take um, towards the end. So uh, opening up the panel discussion then, um, we have a number of disruptive companies here and startups. Um, how do you see companies like uh, BlaBlaCar, Uber, CarAmigo uh, changing mobility and the way we treat mobility in the future. And I'd like to open that to, obviously, the owners of these companies or the representatives of these companies. So, um, Shana, Alex, Philip, who would like to take the first one? Sure. sure. Uh, I, I got yeah. luckily yeah. enough. Uh, so, I don't know if we're going to change uh, mobility entirely. However, we may contribute to uh, maybe the diminishing of the number of cars in uh, circulation in, uh, in Europe or elsewhere uh, due to the fact that uh, a car is unused 95% of the time. So if people uh, you know, share the cars, whether car sharing or uh, ride sharing, I think it can contribute to diminish the number of, car, the number of cars and the emissions and uh, of course the, uh, uh, the traffic jams, uh, which uh, I said before are pretty big in, uh, in Brussels. Um, Yes, so I'm um, talking for Blavacar. Um, what we actually see is that within our community, yeah, we really start to change people's behavior. So as you might or might not know, we already have around 20 million members right now. So if you change their behavior, it can have an impact, of course. Uh, so what are we actually changing? So for those who don't know Blavacar, we're actually a P2P community where people like you have a driver going somewhere and they're taking a passenger with them and they share the costs. So it's always a challenge because we have two players. We need drivers and we need passengers. And what we notice after a while is that those drivers actually convert to passengers. So what happens there is that at some point they are thinking, okay, I need to be somewhere, but do you know what? I'm just gonna have a look on Blah Blah Car and see if I can drive with someone and leave my car at home. If you do that at a big scale, then you can start thinking that you're really like taking cars off the road. Yeah, um, to, to add to that, because I completely agree with uh, what the, my two predecessors pre said, uh, <laughs> the two uh, previous people said, uh, sorry about that. Um, I think we're really moving from um, Actually, mobility as ownership, like I heard in the previous presentation, as well as someone that said, like, my car, my freedom, is something that I think 20 years ago was, was very valid. When you turned 18, you wanted to buy a car. It was like the one thing you were saving for. I think today, today, that's not the, the, the fact anymore. I mean, 
proven cases myself. I'm, uh, in my early 30s and I have never uh, owned a car and I think we're really moving from mobility as ownership to uh, mobility as a service. What does that exactly mean? That people will less and less start using or owning cars but still use them in a sense where they will just want to take advantage of them uh, when, they, when, they, when they need them. So uh, instead of paying for insurance, paying for a car, paying for a parking spot, when I need to get around in the city, I might use the LAN or I might use an Uber. Uh, when I'm going to Paris, I might uh, take a blah blah car or when I want to visit my parents in the countryside, I might just rent the car for a few hours on a car amigo. So I think it's really decreasing uh, ownership of cars. Um, talking of ownership and cars, actually, I just want to throw this one actually to just a general panel. Um, I read last week that there was, I can't remember which, uh, which city it was, that actually has banned cars completely from its city center. Oslo. Is it? Yeah. Oslo. Oslo. So um, do you see that kind of initiative from each local authority actually affecting um, this kind of business model? And I, this is a, an open one to the panel, so anyone can take this one up if you feel brave enough. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I don't think it will happen because actually why are cities banning cars right now is because uh, most cars, uh, they uh, have emissions of uh, little particles, uh, they make noise, they uh, make victims in uh, traffic accidents. And in a future situation, for instance, it is perfectly imaginable to have cars that steer themselves, uh, stop when a pedestrian uh, is passing, uh, so we will have less um, traffic uh, accidents, we'll have less particles uh, in the air because most cars will be uh, electric or something else. So the, the need to ban the car will completely change in the future. And I think that the big difference between today and tomorrow is that the car now is kind of a... Uh, a ballast that we are carrying with us and we, we need it so we can't ban it at all but sometimes when we want to be a pedestrian in the roads and the city then we don't like it so we always like our own car but not the car of somebody else that's our problem right now I think in a future situation where we imagine the car being something that steers itself, that drives on electricity, and that um, can be either rented, either owned, and that can create uh, no more or, or very little uh, traffic accidents, it will have a different place in society. And you will see that people that are now losing time in their mobility, either in public transport or in their car, they will not lose their time, they will fill in their time. Imagine that you are in a self-driving, electric, rented or owned car, doesn't matter. You are there and uh, you go somewhere, but you don't have to steer, so you can do something else. You can read a book, you can talk to somebody, you can phone all the time, you can Facebook, you can do whatever you want. Maybe you can wash your hair, I don't know. Uh, you can do all kinds of things that you cannot do right now because you're steering in your car. And when you take public transport right now, most of the time, half of the time, you're changing from metro to bus, from bus to tram, from this to that, so you lose that time. And the other time you fill in by reading, by doing something. But you still lose the, the whole, whole, uh, half of the time uh, to uh, changing your, your, the way that you uh, move. And I think that, well, public transport will still exist, but when you live in a little town somewhere outside of the big city, there will be less public transport and more rented, self-steering uh, electrical cars, something else. And um, I think that is the big change in uh, losing time versus filling in time, the car being an obstacle and the car being something that you use but doesn't create that much of a noise. Okay, thanks for that, Els. Um, and st yeah, sure. I don't totally agree. Uh, really? I think that it's true that uh, the car is becoming cleaner and cleaner, of course, uh, and that's what will be happening in the next uh, 
five or 10 years that we will all be driving electric cars and electric buses or electric tramways. They always exist, uh, of course. Uh, but I think that, that the real issue for uh, the next few years in the cities won't be emissions, won't be even climate change, but will be space. And uh, I think we have to cope with that. And uh, a queue of electric cars is still a queue. And uh, what we have to think about is how to make our cities more livable and use the different players in the mobility system, in the mobility ecosystem, uh, at their strongest. And so we have, uh, and, and I think Alain Deneve has already uh, said, and some other speakers too, that uh, things will become blurred in the mobility ecosystem in the next few years. And that will be true, I guess. You will have a combination of individual and, co and collective. Uh, differences between private and public will disappear because we will develop into uh, some kind of shared economy. And mobility system won't be an, an, an exception to that. Yes, but I agree uh, to that. But there's a difference between creating pedestrian zones and uh, creating other roads for cars and banning them from some uh, uh, neighborhoods and banning them all together. I think we agree uh, on that level. It's what we have done in the city of Brussels. The city center now is without cars, but around it, in other neighborhoods, it's different. And I agree with you, the space is limited, and when the, when the place becomes more crowded, then you need more space. Uh, now, what we have seen in the city center is that since we banned cars from the, the center neighborhood, you see all kinds of pedestrians in the middle of the road, and they say to us, now we can see what is going on here. Now we can see this patrimonium. Uh, we, can, we, have, we have more space to visit things, to go to cultural, uh, to theaters, to other things, to go to restaurants. But I think that it, it's a, a difference between banning cars and creating spaces for pedestrians on the one side, uh, uh, the, the mobility on the other side, public transport or cars. So I think that we, we agree <laughs> totally on that level. Okay, I'm going to try and multitask here and actually run a, a poll question for the audience, which is, um, now let me see if this works. Uh, does it come up? Oh. And it does. Yep, cool. So um, if you could actually connect to um, uh, wooclap.com slash CSW and, and uh, complete the poll for us, but you know, would you give up your car forever if alternative ways to travel became commonplace everywhere in your city and obviously across, uh, across countries? Um, and while you are running that, I'm going to stick with um, Else then, actually, and, and, um, and maybe yourself. And, and just you know, a, lot of this, a lot of the success of these startups comes from, I guess, uh, the timing and having technology available. Uh, you know, um, is there anything else... Um, in your mind that uh, has bred the success of, you know, Move It, Blah Blah Car, Uber, Car Amigo um, today? Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, technology plays a big part, but it's also, and I mean, that was part of the topics discussed earlier, it's also a little bit of a mindset, right? This whole sharing economy and, and people being more willing to uh, give up ownership, et cetera. Um, uh, so I think that that also plays into that the timing is right for that. Um, I think kind of going back to the the previous question, what they all have in common, or what all these these startups have in common, um, is a little bit you know it's more efficient use of the resources, and whether that's you know by 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 sharing the, the ride, sharing the car, um, uh, making more space in the cities, it's it's all more efficient uh, resources. We try to enable people to use public transport more efficient and then therefore also uh, again um, uh, allow for more efficient uh, resource use and I think that's the fascinating part of, of this uh, yeah, movement that we're seeing. So a lot of um, the success as well, and the take up and the trust, I guess, is is dependent on consumers being able to share their data and, and rate particular services, and, and you get their location and and personal details. 
you know, how, how can you guys actually incentivize more consumers and, and, and users to give up more data in order, to, in order for you to personalize the experience a lot more? Um, Alex? We don't really uh, entice them, we oblige them. Because they need to understand that uh, the owner need to trust us, but also the driver, uh, um, the renter. Uh, so there's no question that everybody understands that they need to give their ID and their uh, license, uh, driving license number and, and the date at which they got it, because otherwise no one will trust them. And that is prior to the rental and after the rental, there's a rating which is uh, mandatory. Uh, each driver needs to rate the, rent, the owner and vice versa. Uh, but outside that, we don't, uh, we don't you know, monitor where they go and stuff like that. We just, uh, it's prior, mostly prior to the rental that they need to give data. Afterwards, it's not our business. Well, data, for example, I mean, it is very important for our business model, but also for the convenience for the, for the, for the consumer. Um, for example, if you take a, a trip on Uber, then you know, we know exactly where that trip started, where that trip ended, but that's also very important in calculating the price, but also in giving you great uh, uh, feedback when something goes wrong on their trip, or you, you say the driver didn't take the shortest route, we need to be able to track that and be able to sense that. But with a lot of data comes also great uh, responsibility. So uh, I think it's up as well to a lot of companies to, to uh, put the rules around data very strict. Uh, not everyone should just have access to all data, and all da and data should only be looked at when it's triggered by, for example, a consumer request. Someone had a bad trip experience, and he comes back to us, and only at that given stage we will look at the details uh, uh, of that uh, of that uh, trip, for example. But then there's some new data as well that we track that uh, that's very important, as as, as Alex mentioned before. Uh, before is the the rating. So after. Uh, all trips as a, as a consumer, but also as a driver, you can rate one another, which gives, gives us amazing feedback on, on the quality of drivers. Uh, and that's not only good for the riders because we can keep the quality of drivers high, it's also good for the drivers because they know when you know, their quality isn't great, uh, what they have to improve. So we also share that with drivers so that they're able to become uh, better at, at providing service. Uh, yes, well, actually, it's already said quite like, um, yeah. Uh, for Blah Blah Car, uh, information is actually very important uh, because what we notice more and more is that the, the better your profile is, the more likely it is that passengers or drivers are going to want to have this ride with you um, because um, Blah Blah Car would not be where it is right now if it wouldn't have worked around all those trust pillars. Um, and the most important one, which you guys also mentioned, is, uh, is the ratings. Um, we are still encouraging them um, to rate each other. Um, and we notice that people who had like, at least one positive rating, that the likeliness that they will find a passenger um, is a lot higher than those who like, have an um, unfulfilled uh, profile, no rating, so we're really trying to work on that and encourage our community to do that. We actually did a trust study around it and um, it, we scaled them like we asked, like, who do you trust most? And uh, Blah Blah Car uh, actually ended up quite well, like people with a full profile, with ratings, uh, people trusted Blah Blah Car members more than they trusted their own neighbors, um, even their Facebook contacts or their colleagues. So it was quite impressive to see, and it's very important. Um, sticking on the um, the review angle, and I guess the trust as well, is that um, I think it was uh, again this week or last week, Amazon has taken to court some people for providing false reviews. So how can me? or I or everyone here as a potential user trust the, the kind of feedback mechanism that you have in place. You mentioned that you have something at blah blah car, but obviously you know, these things can be gamed, I guess. So is, how, do I, how do I know that your profile is accurate? You know, what are the authentication methods that you all have in place to make sure that my trust that's placed in you and also the person ultimately providing the service is, is guaranteed? In our case, we verify, really, uh, I mean, there's an algorithm to check stuff like the address, phone number, but there's also the visual verification of uh, 
both the owner and the renter. And the second thing is uh, it's impossible to give a rating if you haven't been involved in a rental. So it's just impossible, unlike TripAdvisor, where you can pretty much give rates on anything without having ever been in a restaurant here. It's just impossible. But maybe it's not known enough uh, that it's impossible. So there's some education, I guess, yeah. uh, in the wider public. Okay. So we have all your business models here right now. Um, and I guess a question for you else in, uh, in terms of local authorities and existing services like municipal buses and, and, and uh, trams, you know, how do these, how do they coexist? Do they coexist? You know, especially in a user's mind, you know, the choice is great, but um, should they coexist or should one replace the other? How, is, how do you see that playing out in the future? Um, yeah, in the mind of uh, many consumers, they coexist. But in the mind of uh, many governments, they don't. Actually, um, uh, the thing that uh, Shana was talking about, trust, is uh, uh, very important here. And in traditional uh, services, like traditional taxis, traditional um, hotel uh, tourism sector, there you have government or officials who rate the hotels, who uh, license the taxis. And they uh, make sure that there is the trust with the consumer. And that's in the traditional uh, way of seeing the economy. Right now, we are seeing that consumers are rating themselves. And if normally they don't get the information that there is some um, uh, fraud or something else, then they will have trust in the, in the company. Because as long as they see that what they see on the ratings is corresponding to what they experienced, they will have trust. And now the big issue is to convince governments that um, this trust that these consumers and these companies build up together, that this is equal to the trust that was created by officials raiding hotels, raiding uh, taxis, uh, and doing other things. And that is a big issue. And this is not yet realized. And that is why a lot of legislation is not modified. I know many of you here are early adapters, so it might come to a shock uh, come as a shock to you that um, majority in Parliament, Brussels Parliament, Flemish Parliament, doesn't matter, Belgian Parliament, French Parliament, doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's equal for all Parliaments that the majority will be more, um, uh, they will say, well, is it a good idea that we let consumers rate and maybe we need some control and how can we know that there won't be any fraud or corruption and how can we know this and how can we know that not knowing that even now with officials uh, rating things you cannot know either because we have many many complaints about the traditional taxi sector many I think it's not because it's officially certified that it's a better thing, but that doesn't already exist in the minds of politicians. And that is really a thing that we need to create together. And um, you can say, well, oh, it's weird, they're like behind uh, the early adapters, but I think that we need to create this trust together and it will take time. And the big problem is right now that we do not have this time. We saw that, uh, for instance, a Jump was um, a competitor to Uber left the scene because they couldn't keep up with the fact that the cars uh, were uh, taken out of the market by officials because there is legislation which is really restrictive and which is uh, saying that you need to be licensed by uh, the government, things like that. So this trust doesn't already exist enough uh, in, the, in the heads of politicians to make sure that all these innovative, uh, innovative companies can uh, coexist with traditional sectors. And this is really, really a big issue today. And, um, well, I do not have the solution uh, <laughs> myself, of course. 
Uh, but I, I, um, I'm creating a, a, a forum, Technopolitics, and I created that for the first time in February uh, uh, 2014. And, uh, 14 and February 2015, I will create another uh, forum, Technopolitics. And it's all about creating the trust that we should uh, leave choice and freedom to the consumers and the companies. And then when there is some fraud, for instance, TripAdvisor, we all know that sometimes people raid, and these are not people, but robots or other things. Well, if people know that, they will say, hey, I won't look at TripAdvisor anymore because there are no real people. So because it goes so fast and because uh, the, the, the thing is that we are so connected, we have Twitter to say, hey, this is not normal, or Facebook. So it changes all the time, and it's like self-regulating. But this notion, it needs to be spread more and trusted more. Coming from a pretty traditional sector myself, public transport, uh, I'm convinced that uh, the different kind of providers in terms of mobility as a service uh, should not only uh, coexist, but should, as Alain would call it, co-create. Uh, that has been one of the reasons why, uh, from our side, we try, with all the experience we have, with also the means that we have, we try to enable uh, new initiatives like, for instance, car sharing. We have been uh, a major shareholder with Cambio in, in Flanders, for instance. We're also uh, trying to, to uh, financially support systems like bike sharing because we're convinced that, uh, as I told earlier, uh, the mobility system of the future will be one where things will be combined and where people will have the possibility and also the connectivity to choose between what at one point in time for one type of uh, of uh, going from A to B, they will find best in their own view. Uh, and from the public transport sector, instead of being on the defensive and, and being afraid of what is uh, happening all over the world, and we won't be able even if uh, we would like to try so, which I don't, we won't be able to stop peer-to-peer -peer applications and peer-to-peer -peer initiatives to, to be more and more present in our mobility world. Uh, and rather than being on the defensive, we should try and look for partnerships and co-create. Um, talking of partnerships, co-creation and things like that, I'm just going to uh, pitch an, another question to the audience here, which is how worried are you that crowdsourcing um, and the rise of the crowd economy services will disrupt actually your business model? So people in here must, um, you know, I would assume uh, are here with a, a specific interest. Um, but if you have a business, are you worried that your s traditional business model as it stands today may be disrupted in the future by crowd sharing or crowdsourcing initiatives? So actually, Roger, sticking with you again, you know, I read that um, somewhere that there were bus services that crowd shared um, ride journeys uh, according to the, um, the passengers there and altered the journeys accordingly. You know, um, do you see your business offering those kind of services um, uh, in the future where traditional set routes are now um, set according to you know, the number of passengers and who wants to go where? Well, I, I think that, that public transport in its uh, traditional way should concentrate on where, on where it is strongest and where it is most useful to society. And that is where there is, or where there are large or thick streams of, of uh, of people moving from one, one place to another. Of course, uh, we can make use of all kinds of, of new technologies and, and the data that we gather, we, we gather a lot of data in terms of refining our offer towards, towards uh, our customers. But I think, uh, and I, I truly believe that we shouldn't try to solve all of the problems in the mobility ecosystem. We're not fit for that. We tr should try to and find partnerships and integrate and play a role, play a major role perhaps in how smart cities try to integrate mobility by combining and integrating all kinds of data and players uh, on, on their territory. Uh, so that's what I believe will be the, the, the role of public transport in the near future. Perhaps provide a backbone where large groups of peoples uh, are, are going to, this, to the same in the same direction or to the same place. But then again, refining the whole system will also be a matter of, of building up partnerships 
and giving people the choice of different kinds of, of combinations of uh, mobility. About this, uh, in France recently, uh, SNCF, uh, the French Railways, invested 28 million in a Wii car, which is the French car Amigo, much bigger. Uh, so you may wonder why a company like SNCF is investing in a Wii car. It's because they figured out that uh, out of 3,000 train stations, only 150 have a local car rental company. So people can rent out a car from only 150, whereas with WeCar, pretty much any train station will have cars around so that people can come by train and rent a car. And in that sense, that made sense to make a deal with uh, WeCar. But to start with, you know, a company of like uh, 200,000 people and a company of 20 people was kind of unusual. And do you see if that pattern take, you know, happening all over where people are, you know, coexist? Well, not coexisting, but the, the, the cooperate, cooperation and the partnering. It's very dependent on the mindset of yeah. the, the manager of the company, whether they only want to focus on we provide railways and nothing else, or whether it could make sense to partner with this or that country, uh, company. If, if I may add a few examples from what we experience ourselves, since we have invested in Cambio in the car sharing system, we see that those people who have... Uh, who enter into the Cambio car sharing system also make more use of public transport because they make less kilometers with their car than when they had their own private car. Also, uh, we invested uh, together with some other partners in, in the, the Velo uh, bike sharing system in the city of Antwerp. And there we see that in terms of ridership, uh, we are losing some of our passengers because they make more use of, of the, the bike sharing system. That's good for the city of Antwerp. And it's good for our own business model because those people who make less use of public transport, strangely enough, they don't buy an, a season ticket anymore, but when the weather is bad, they leave their bike, they go into public transport, and then they buy a single ticket. And in terms of our own business model, that's a good, a good thing to do. So you can co-create and coexist, definitely. Um, I'm going to touch on a question that someone threw from uh, the previous session, actually, which was, um, you know, um, as a startup, do you just start and then work around the regulation, um, or do you work with the regulation when you actually start? And Alex, you've you've basically gone to them and worked with them, um, and, and 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 as a consequence, obviously, are coming out more transparent um, uh, regarding your, your the, the taxation. So. I guess it's, a, it's, it's an open one to the, the, the panel here. Um, you know, what can you do more um, from a, a local authority and a legislative, legislative perspective to, uh, you know, foster that kind of a uh, relationship where um, you don't have to think that you have to work around their legislation to get the results. You can actually go forward and work with them. Is there something more that both startups and the governments need to be doing in this regard? And that's an open one. So, feel brave. <laughs> uh, I'll take this question uh, to start. Um, you know, I, I think it's important that there, there's a constructive dialogue going on and that there's cooperation going on. That's something that, that at Uber we're, we're constantly trying to have. But if I remember back in, in the early days, and I think now it's much better, and it's, it's easy to talk to politicians and everyone understood that this is coming and we need to deal with this and so we're sitting all around the table uh, uh, looking at what is Uber, what are these platforms and, and how can we regulate them and how should we regulate them and maybe deregulate the existing sector. But I mean, it hasn't always been like that. When we first wanted to come to, 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 to Belgium was, um, if I remember well, 2013 and we put our plans on the table uh, at that time, uh, the previous Brussels government, uh, Minister of Mobility, and we just got a no. Uh, and no, no open dialogue, uh, uh, not, not the possibilities. It was just, you don't fit in this legislation, you're, you're not welcome here. And yeah, then you're kind of with your back against the wall, and, and it's kind of like, you know, <laughs> it comes to the point where what do you do at that given, uh, at that given moment? And at that moment, I think, you know, we had actually uh, a company which I have a lot of respect for, which today isn't around anymore, Jump, uh, that actually was very innovative, a Belgian company that launched before us. And because they had launched, we decided to, to, to go as well. 
but then I think it's up to, to, to making things go fast enough, because often uh, the, the, the timelines of, of a startup and the timelines of, of politicians is not the same timeline. Um, and as you see, like as else, else had mentioned, for jump it, it's over, uh, and, and and that's a sad thing uh, when when legislation doesn't adapt itself fast enough. Okay. Uh, good